please. Hello, everybody. Uh, dear chairs, thank you for inviting me to participate in this Congress. I would also like to thank uh, Novartis for organizing my uh, transfer here and my stay here. Actually, as you can see from my name, I'm a Greek guy working in Berlin since about 16 years now, but somehow familiar with this nice and warm, let's say, uh, getting together with people. So I have, I have picked up two, two topics for today. One is HS, hydrogenitis superativa. The second one is the urticaria. So I will start with my, let's say, favorite topic of the last, for the last years maybe. And maybe we can understand why all these colleagues that deal with psoriasis, they also have something to do with HS. Yeah, so I'll start with that. We keep an eye on HS because more things are coming in the, in the upcoming months or years maybe. So we have a very nice pipeline for this disease that's not good for our patients. These are my conflicts of interest. Of course, I will be uh, neutral for this presentation. And I will start with the definition acne inversa or hydrogenitis superativa. Both terms are wrong. So this is not an acne, but it's inversa because we have this in the indigenous areas of the skin. And this is not hydrogenitis, but it's a superativa because we have this uh, pus um, coming out from these lesions. So we don't have a better terminology now, so we need uh, to work on that. So let's say we call it HS. And what HS? This is a chronic inflammatory. It's a T-cell mediated skin disease. And if you're going to diagnose your patients, you need actually only these three points. If they have the typical lesions like inflammatory nodules, like abscesses, fistules, or scars, and these are scars not because of surgery, these are spontaneous uh, uh, scars, and you have the typical localizations like um, in axillary areas, inguinal areas, submammary areas, inframammary areas, and then you also need this typical course of the disease. You need to have these abscesses in these areas at least twice every six months. If you have one ax and an abscess in this area for once, this is not HS. This is maybe an inflammation from something different, the bacteria or something else. So you need all these three factors. And if all this, these three cases are positive, then you have the diagnosis of HS. Um, we also have these risk factors, let's say, but these are not important for the diagnosis. So we know that most of the patients are smoking. We know that some of them, they have a genetical predisposition. About one-third of the patients, they have a positive family history for AHS. We have identified some mutations, maybe in the uh, gamma secretase gene, that is a loss of function uh, mutation in some patients. And of course, we have this high BMI in the patients, both males and females. So these are, let's say, some risk factors or, let's say, some hints that may lead us to the, to the diagnosis. And even if it's appearing to be that easy and that clear, this disease is not easy because it has different clinical phenotypes. So you can also have, let's say, this uh, scarring disease in the axillary areas, but you can also have at the same time inflammatory nodules all over the body. So we don't have one phenotype because if we talk about psoriasis, we have these thick plaques, but if we discuss about HS, then we have several things that we have to, uh, to see. So, even if it's that easy, sometimes with these, let's say, uh, uh, different phenotypes, the diagnosis is becoming difficult. And because this diagnosis sometimes becomes difficult, we need about 10 years. This is a prospective trial that we did in Germany about uh, um, three years ago. And from the time of the first symptoms until the patients got diagnosed with HS, we lose 10 years. So if you, this, if you think about it, that the first symptoms in this trial, there was about 500 patients, the first symptoms the, be, began at the age of uh, 24, and then we set the diagnosis at the middle 30s, so we have missed 10 years. That means we had 10 years of false diagnosis that we treated falsely, and of course, we did, we didn't manage to stop the comorbidities of this disease. So we have other consequences if we don't set the diagnosis as fast as possible. So because exactly of these uh, um, different phenotypes of the disease, and because we characterized this disease in the last year, so if you, if you look at the clinical trials or epidemiological trials, 20 years ago, 
then you don't have a definition of this disease. And that's why we don't have, let's say, the, the clear prevalence data. So the prevalence may be from 0.05 to 4%. So this is not, you know, you cannot, you cannot make it for, define, let's say, the prevalence of the disease. So from the European countries, we suppose we are at about 0.5% uh, of the patients. And we also, this disease starts, let's say, at the puberty and it's going down the activity at the uh, menopause. So the, we do have, let's say, these hormonal components that they are very strong in this, in this disease. And um, what we see actually from the old studies and from the new studies, they used to say that was a, a disease of the women, but this is not the case because the new studies, we have a, a, a main, male to female uh, rate one to one or maybe one to two, but not one to five. So, um, the thing is, uh, how many doctors do this patient's visit while they are searching for the right diagnosis? And they see all this list, they go, of course, to the GPs, they go to the dermatologists, they go to the surgeons, and every, let's say, uh, 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 discipline that has to do with these areas, they are on this list. But the point is, who has who has set the right diagnosis, and that was the dermatologist. So I think this is a disease that we have to manage. This is a dermatological disease, and we have to manage this disease. If we cannot operate, we can have a collaboration for the operation. If we cannot manage the comorbidities, we have a GP that collaborate the, the, the comorbidities, but this is, a, say, a dermatological disease. So what happens to these patients? Of course, they have problems with sexual life, the quality of life, with, with the work they lose their work or they go to work and don't work efficiently. So this is all the problems that we have to face if we have a patient with HS. And they are young patients. They have family planning. They make career. They try to work. They try to travel. So all, this, all, this, all these things make the disease even more uh, difficult than the disease itself. Why I say that we understand the disease in the last years? Because if you look back then, we, we have perceived this disease in a different way. They, we thought that it was like a bacterial infection that leads to the necrosis of the uh, um, um, sweating glands. But we know today this is not the case. So, and then we changed from the sweating glands to the apocrine glands there. But also this theory was not the one that we can describe this disease. And it was let's say at the, uh, at the uh, 80s, that we could identify this, like say, Aiken characteristic of this disease, but that does not mean that we'll have to deal with an Aiken. So you see that we describe the follicular occlusion, that we have all, already all these um, clinical descriptions of the disease, like the Aiken tetrate and uh, Aiken uh, trias. So, we are switching somehow from the sweating glands and from apocrine glands to the, to the hair follicles. And at the late 90s or now, we have understand the immunology of the disease, not, not fully understand the disease, but we know this is not the case as well. We do have the follicular occlusion, but this is not the cause of the disease. So we have gone, we have gone a step forward to the, to the um, uh, let's say, immune pathogenesis of this disease. What happens actually in HS? The first thing to happen is this follicular occlusion. And if you see the skin exactly at this point, at the hair follicles, you have an epidermis that resembles very much the psoriatic skin. So you had a psoriasis form, uh, uh, um, epidermis exactly in this point there. What means that? That you have this hyperkeratosis, you have an occlusion of the hair follicles. So if we occlude these follicles, they dilate. So we see some nodules like that. And what happens if we don't treat that or if it keeps on being, let's say, close there, they dilate more and more and they attract cytokines and chemokines. And in that case, we have an abscess. So it's like these small openings there that they drain the abscess to the, to the surface of the skin. 
And if the disease progresses, they have these connections, these tunnels that they connect more than two or three or four abscesses. And in that case, we have these tunnels, these big tunnels, and these big tunnels, they tend to heal with scarring. So this is, let's say, the physical progression of this disease from the nodules to the scarring. If you have such a disease, you cannot do nothing, so you have to operate. If you have something like between this stage and this stage, maybe you can do it with, uh, with a new um, biologics. The immunology of the disease is very complicated. It's very, very complicated. That's why we, have not, we haven't found yet this key cytokine that we can turn out this disease. This is, this is how the disease starts. When it starts, we have something like a non-specific inflammation of the skin that is, let's say, focused all around these hair follicles that were stopped there, okay? And as the time goes by, this inflammation has, let's say, the profiling of the psoriatic disease. And this is at the beginning, at the very beginning of this, of this disease of HS. And you can recognize a lot of cytokines that we already know from other diseases, like we have the TNF alpha, we have the uh, um, uh, interleukin 17. But what is actually important in this slide, we have at least four systems that they participate in this disease. So we have the skin up there, we have the fatty tissue, because it's also an inflammation organ. We have the blood vessels. We have, of course, the immune system with all the cells. And we also have the fibroblasts. So it's not a disease of the skin or the immune system. So we have at least five or four systems that they work together to make this disease. So this is the first step of the development of the disease. But if you go forward, then you have the second step of the disease. In the, that case, you have all these tunnels with this pus and this uh, inflammation there. And in this case, it tends to be a neutrophilic dermatosis. So we, we go away from this psoriatic phenotype of the cytokines, and we move forward to a neutrophilic dermatosis. And um, this resembles the model of an auto-inflammatory disease. So what you see here, we have much more neutrophils. So in the neutrophils, they attract or they react or they produce other cytokines than the T cells. So in this case, we have interleukin uh, 36. We have, of course, uh, uh, EL17 because this is also has also an effect on the, on, the, on the neutrophiles. And we also have the granulocyte colony stimulated factors that they somehow participate in the uh, progression of the disease. And why I refer these molecules? Because in the, in the next months or in the next years, we will have targeted therapies against exactly these molecules. Okay, so this is somehow, we try to develop our strategies according to the states of the disease. But it's not easy because you don't have only the first slide or this slide. You have an overlapping of both in the different sides. So this is how, how the disease develops. So, but as you can see here, we have a lot of cytokines that we can already target and we'll try to see if they work. Some of them, they do work and some of them, they failed. So if you see the uh, uh, interleukin 23, both clinical trials with rizankinzumab and guzelkumab, they failed in HS. So they were not better than the placebo group. Maybe because the placebo group was too high, it can also be the case. But in these trials, we didn't see a benefit from these cytokines. And this happens with other, uh, other cytokines too. But we do have some successful molecules, and we will discuss about that today and maybe in the future, in the next year maybe. So all these cytokines that we already know for psori from psoriasis, they tend to, to cause other concomitant diseases that they have, let's say, the same background. And this is the comorbidities of HS. And if you see this panel, actually, all these comorbidities are well known from the psoriasis patients, with the exception, of course, of this uh, uh, hormonological comorbidities, but the metabolic syndrome, even in very young patients, uh, SPA, um, the inflammatory bowel diseases, and of course, the metabolic uh, disease, they are all comorbidities that we know from psoriasis and 
the reasons because we have the same cytokines that circulating in the body of HS patients, like in the psoriasis patients. So this is a very sad slide, actually. This is a very sad slide because this is everything that we have tried in order to treat HS uh, when we didn't, uh, we didn't manage HS. So you didn't see several topical therapies. You see anti-inflammatory therapies. You also see Botox and um, biologics that do not work. So this is, this is our desperate effort to treat HS patients. That's for me, let's say, an unmet need how to treat and how to manage this disease. So, and this is another sad slide because this is the current European guideline for the disease and we have actually only one drug that is, is approved for this disease, okay? So we work on that as well. I suppose that the next, in the next months we'll have the new guidelines with at least two new medications and that, and that will be great. Um, what we see here actually, we do have the antibiotics, but we take uh, clindamycin or tetracyclines for the antibiotics, either in a topical or in a systematic uh, route, and we also have adalimumab and infliximab. Adalimumab is approved for that infliximab, not. And you see here how they work actually. So the antibiotics, they work in the bacteria, but also the antibiotics we use for HS they have an anti-inflammatory potential. So we take these antibiotics because they modulate the immune system. We don't take penicillins, okay? Penicillins don't work in HS. So we also have acetretin as a first-line systemic therapy. Why? Because acetretin blocks this hyperkeratosis of the hair follicle. So if we start the disease at the very beginning, maybe we see a benefit if we start the therapy with neotigazone. Then we have, of course, the targeted therapies like TNF-alpha, and interleukin-17, that's actually the new thing today. And of course, if you see the guidelines, um, in all steps of the disease, we have some operational procedures or lasers or topical or wide excisions. And of course, we have the lifestyle management, the patient management as well. So we have to treat not only in this row, but also in this row and in this row as well. And this is how we intervene with the lifestyle of the patients. So we advise the patients. I know it's not easy to change the lifestyle of a patient, but this is actually the things that we have to talk with them, at least at the very first presentation in our offices. So we have to discuss about these uh, uh, um, risk factors like weight reduction, smoking reduction, all this loose fitting clothes, and maybe also hair removal, because we do have trials with Alexandrate and, uh, and the yak lasers. If you have a very, um, a very new disease, a very mild disease, if you epilate the hair follicles of the hair with the lasers, maybe you can, you can manage the, the course of the disease, or you can at least uh, suppress the severity of the disease. So this is the only one drug that has been approved till now for AHS, so this was the adalimumab, so the pioneer trials, and what we have achieved, that half of the patients have achieved a 50% improvement of the skin condition. So it's nothing, I think, it's good that we have it, but you cannot compare it with other diseases like psoriasis. So half of the patients, we will improve to 50%, okay? So, and now we do have a new, a new drug, this is not approved yet. It's the Cosendix for 